Good morning, church. Today's reading is going to be from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. For they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. You guys ready? Good to have you with us. Welcome to Desert Breeze Community Church. Also welcome those of you that are on YouTube right now, I think. Uh, we were having some glitches on that, so hang in there with us. If it doesn't go this time, we'll put it up later. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32 is what we just read. Oh my goodness, we just started on a real high note last weekend, and now it gets really, really dark as we're working our way through Romans. I don't know if you noticed that as we were reading the text, and so buckle your seat belts here. You Can't Save Yourself is the title of this weekend's message, the book of Romans, How the Gospel Changes Everything. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. You guys agree with that? I do, wholeheartedly. And more and more every year, and I'm so thankful for the gospel. Nothing can transform a human heart, heal a wounded soul, satisfy our deepest longing like the gospel. And the book of Romans is all about the gospel. And so if you got your Bibles open, grab your notes. You can follow along. Why must the righteous live by faith? That's the first question. Why must the righteous live by faith? Why is a received righteousness the only way to be in a right relationship with God. You remember the verses we finished up the text with last week, verses 16, 17, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 17 describes the gospel, gives us the characteristics, the content of the gospel. And it, it goes like this, I've got it right here. Verse 17, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith or beginning and ending in faith. See, this isn't a righteousness that you put together and offer to God. You don't give that to God, and then maybe He accepts you and blesses you. This is a righteousness He gives to us. That's what He's talking about here. It's an imputed righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus. It's, it's quite spectacular and phenomenal. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we don't get our act together and work real hard and... and try to do everything God wants us to do. We don't obey God and then get His love and blessing. We have His love and blessing in Christ Jesus. We've received His righteousness, therefore we want to obey Him. That's, that's how it works. If you flip that order, it becomes religion. And so why must the righteous live by faith? Why is a received righteousness the only way to be in a right relationship with God? We all want to be in a right relationship with God. 
in this life, but especially as we head into the next life for all eternal life. And the reason why we have to receive our righteousness, because it's on your notes, because you can't save yourself, either through irreligion or religion. Irreligion? What? Religion? Yeah, absolutely. You see, there's only three ways you can live life. I used to think years ago, and I, when I was raised in the church, I thought there was two ways. There's the gospel and then the prodigal son who, who took the father's inheritance and went out and did the wild, crazy living. And I thought, well, there's only two ways. You either you do a wild life or you, you do the God life. And actually, there's three ways. And it's actually represented in that story. Uh, we've typically called it the, you know, the prodigal son as if only one son is prodigal. Prodigal means extravagant. He has this extravagant lifestyle. Actually, it'd be better titled uh, the parable of the prodigal sons, or better yet, it'd be better titled the, the prodigal father, because he's the one that's extravagant. He's extravagant in his grace toward both of his sons. Both of his sons are lost. One's very irreligious. He takes the family inheritance and goes out and spends it on wild, crazy living, thinking he's going to find a sense of righteousness. When you think of righteousness, think of your resume. Think of your meaning, hope, and happiness. So he thinks he's going to discover life by living it out on his own, away from the Father. But the other son is the religious son, and um, he leaves the Father without leaving the farm, and he thinks he's going to earn this right standing with God. So you could put it like this. So you got three ways you can live. The gospel, the righteous shall live by faith. You're either living that way or you're doing the irreligion, irreligion kind of gig. You're, you're chasing after self-discovery, breaking all the rules or making up your own rules. That's the younger brother. Or you're doing the religious route. That's moral conformity. You're trying to keep all the rules. You're trying to earn your right standing with God. You can never do that. That's the elder brother. He was pretty bitter, very self-righteous, holier than thou. So I think you're tracking with me here. It's just you can live one of those three lives. And oftentimes I've seen the church invite people from an irreligious life into a religious life. That is not the gospel. They totally miss it. So you got the gospel, irreligion, religion. Now what's fascinating about this is he just finishes up by telling us, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He tells us that we, the gospel is about a... Um, not an earned righteousness, but a given or an imputed righteousness from God. God gives us a righteousness. And then he goes right into coming after the irreligious by saying, oh, by the way, you can't, you can't save yourself. And he addresses from verses 18 to 32, the irreligious. But just wait, chapter 2 of Romans, he's going to come after the religious. So look at your notes here. Paul will spin from Romans 1.18 to Romans 3.20, showing us why we need God to give us righteousness. It's a gift, gift righteousness. Why we can't attain it, earn it, or deserve it ourselves. It will present to us a very dark picture of humanity. It is in this dark picture of humanity that the glory of the gospel of Christ shines all the brighter now, in the coming weeks, the book of Romans will disturb the comfortable, the proud, and it will comfort the disturbed, the humble. By the way, I just need to say, this is a PG-13 message, because eventually we're going to have to talk about sex. Ooh, a couple of you just woke up right there. <laughs> what? Did he say something? Sex? Yeah. Yeah. So PG-13, just be aware of that. Now, this is what I believe. I believe that hard messages produce soft people. Soft messages produce hard people. Our pulpits in America today are filled with soft messages. Therefore, we've got a lot of hard people in America that are very proud. And that's why I'm not afraid of the gospel. I'm not afraid of what we study. I love how we study here because it's very easy for a lot of pastors to teach topical messages. Therefore, they can teach their pet topics and they don't have to deal with the hard stuff. Because when you work through a text, guess what? You got to work through the hard stuff. This is the hard stuff we're going to deal with this morning. Important stuff. This is the life transforming kind of stuff as we address it. And so hard messages produce soft people. Soft messages produce hard people. God opposes the proud, the hard, but he gives grace to the humble, the soft. Man, I want to be soft before God. I don't know about you. I mean, you guys agree with that? I don't want God to oppose me. I want God, and I need His grace. 
And to have his grace, all you need is need. You got to recognize that. You got to be humble before God. You got to be soft before him. Now, here's the big idea that he's wanting us to understand as he transitions, after he kind of laid a good solid foundation on the gospel. He's basically saying God's wrath is being revealed and is deserved. In other words, all human beings apart from the gospel are under God's wrath. And he's going to make that point all the way up until Romans 3.20. So we got a few weeks of this. All human beings apart from the gospel are under God's wrath. And so here's how the outline's laid out. Take a look at your notes here. So introduction, God's wrath is being revealed and is deserved. That's kind of the summary statement, verse 18. And then he unpacks it in verses 19 through 25. He's going to answer the question, why is God's wrath being revealed? And then in verses 26 through 32, the rest of the text all the way to chapter 2, he's going to answer the question, how is God's wrath being revealed? That's where we're going. Okay, you guys ready? We need to first pray, though. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just take a moment before God, and let's ask for His help. I'd like for you to pray uh, Psalm 139, 23 through 24, and Psalm 86, 11. I'm going to say these words, and I want you to say these words in your heart to God. If you, if you mean it, if you want Him to, to make you soft, to be humble before Him, you want Him to speak to you this morning. So we pray this morning, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. In Jesus' beautiful name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. So take a look at this introduction. God's wrath is being revealed and is deserved. That's based on verse 18. Now, when you think of God's wrath, what comes to mind? I think a lot of people cringe because I think they have a wrong definition of God's wrath. God's wrath is not like sinful human anger or wrath. God does not lose his temper, fly into a rage, or is ever malicious, spiteful, or vindictive. In fact, here's your first fill in the blank on your notes. God's wrath is his settled opposition to ungodliness and unrighteousness motivated by his love for us. I don't think you can have true love apart from righteous indignation. Notice how I said that, not unrighteous indignation. I think if you have real love, you're going to exercise righteous indignation appropriately. I mean, when you see a loved one hurting themselves or hurting others, you should get angry. There should be a righteous indignation. That's what we have with God. Take a look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So God's wrath is revealed toward people who have decided to live for themselves rather than to live for God. That would be ungodliness, and others, that would be unrighteousness. They suppress any truth that challenges their their self-centeredness. Mark 12, 29 through 31, it's known as the great commandment. You guys are familiar with the great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God would be godliness, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that would be godliness. God wants us to love him. I mean, think about this. He created us as objects of his love. So he says, hey... Your first goal in life should be to to love me back because I'm going to pour all my love into your life. So I want you to love me back. I want us to have a love relationship. And then out of that, you'll be able to love the people in your life. That will be righteousness. The opposite would be ungodliness, loving anything more than we love God, and unrighteousness, not really loving people as we should because we don't have that capacity to love them like we should because we're not drawing that from God. So damaging our vertical relationship damages our horizontal relationships. So if we have ungodliness happening vertically, horizontally, we're going to have unrighteousness. That's what we see happening in our culture today. Subverting our relationship with God has an effect on our relationship with each other and creation. We see that unraveling in Genesis 3. So here's how we could say it. You've heard me say it many times before. All human problems are ultimately symptoms. That's unrighteousness. The cause is our sinful separation from God. That's ungodliness. And the solution is the gospel. 
The solution is the gospel. True love detests what destroys the beloved. You guys agree with that? True love detests what destroys the beloved. Nearly a century ago, an old dead theologian, E.H. Gifford, wrote, Human love here offers a true analogy. The more a father loves his son, the more he hates in him the drunkard, the liar, the traitor. Anger isn't the opposite of love. Hate is. And the final form of hate is indifference. So if you love someone, when they hurt themselves or hurt others, you're going you're to be angry. There's going to be a righteous indignation. And that's totally appropriate. Now, we need to talk a little bit more about the wrath of God so that we have an understanding of, of His judgment. When you think of wrath, think of His justice, His judgment. And so there's three different uh, ways that God's wrath is revealed. God's wrath will be revealed in the future judgment, judgment of the last days. We'll talk about that next week. He, he mentions that in Romans 2, 5. So the wrath of God, final judgment is yet to come. And then there is a present revealing of it in the public administration of justice. We'll talk about that eventually when we get to Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. However, this text is talking about a present revealing of the wrath of God where He turns us over to consequences of our own willful and stubborn self-centeredness. So this is what He's saying. So the wrath of God is right now being revealed. And so we're going to unpack that. We'll talk about that by saying uh, why is it being revealed and then how is it being revealed. A couple more uh, statements we need to make as it relates to the wrath of God and um, His justice and His judgment. Here's the next one. It's on your notes. If you don't understand or believe in the wrath of God, the gospel won't thrill you, transform you, or empower you. All of us can probably quote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not what? Anybody? Perish. Perish. What? Perish what? I didn't. I mean, you kind of read through that. You just think about the love of God and believing in Him and an eternal life. And, but if we don't believe in Him, we're going to perish. We're going to perish under the wrath of God. That's what we're going to perish under, His judgment. We're going to perish under the wrath of God. That's why I like verses like 1 John 2, 2, 4, 10, and uh, Romans 3, 23. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins big word. Do you understand what that word means? It means this. Propitiation means that God's wrath is turned away from us, and we are restored to a place of favor and friendship with God, because all of that wrath that was, that was directed towards us was placed on Christ on the cross. Remember when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and He prays out to the Father and says, let this cup pass from me. What was the cup? It was the cup of God's wrath, the cup of God's judgment but not my will, your will be done. He drank the cup of the Father's wrath that was meant for us so we don't have to face His wrath. That makes me really, really happy, okay? I'm just saying. I mean, that excites me. That's why I, I understand this whole exchange and this, and this righteousness that I've received, man. I am just delighted. And, and if you understand that and you live in reality, I, I'm telling you, not much should get you down if anything, should get you down. So, you can receive forgiveness for your sin, or you can receive punishment for your sin. That's, that's your choice. Here, here's the interesting thing about this, and as you'll see, God doesn't force His way into our lives. You can't have love and relationship apart from freedom and choice. He doesn't force our hand. He's offering us love and freedom and joy and peace, unlike we could ever experience before. But we can turn our face against God, our back on Him. And He's giving us choices here. So you can receive forgiveness for your sin, or you can receive punishment for your sin. Either Jesus gets your wrath on the cross, or you get His wrath in hell. Those are the two choices that the Bible gives us. I know that's not a popular message in America today. Not many pastors or preachers talk about that. And yet we need to hear that because I'm telling you, that is what gives me the indescribable, indestructible joy that I have. Because I know what I've been saved from. I was terribly lost. 
He's continuing to save me. He has set me free from the penalty of sin. He's in the process of setting me free from the power of sin. And one of these days, he's going to set me free completely from the very presence of sin. And that will be with him for all eternity. I am so thankful for that. See, that's what stirs that love and excitement. And that's what, as I said, if you don't understand or believe the wrath of God, the gospel won't thrill you, transform you, or empower you. That's why it doesn't have the effect that it should have on people's lives. Because it's not being taught what we truly have in the gospel. Here's the next one. So we got to talk a little bit about the doctrine of judgment and eternal punishment. Because we're, this is what we're talking about here all the way to chapter, chapter 3, verse 20 is what Paul's talking about here. So the doctrine of judgment and eternal punishment is important for two reasons. Two reasons. When you lessen the penalty for a wrong, you make the wrong less serious and the person wrong less serious or less important. You guys tracking with me? Got to understand that. So if you have a country where you kill somebody and the penalty is $100, that devalues the life of the person. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. So what if it's a, a million dollars? What if it's life in prison what if it, or capital punishment? You see, the greater the penalty, the more serious the crime and the more important the person. Just makes sense. Anything less than eternal punishment lessens sin and lessens the God who has been sinned against. So it just makes perfect sense for me that a sin against an infinite being has an, or is an infinite sin and therefore has infinite consequences. Here's your next point that's on your notes. When you lessen the penalty for a wrong, you lessen the cost of Christ on the cross and you lessen his love for you. I've had people say, or when someone says this to you, oh, I just believe in a God who loves everybody without having to die on a cross for anybody. So let me ask you this question. What did it cost your God to love you? What did it cost him to love you? Nothing. And also, your God obviously is not a very just God because he seems to just overlook injustice and sin and evil. That seems to be inconsistent. By the way, when you look at the cross, you're looking at the collision of both the justice of God and the love of God on our behalf. So God is both loving and he's very just. He can't overlook our sin, but he placed all of our sin on his son, our Savior, on the cross so that we could be set free. Absolutely amazing. I love it. That's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So that's the introduction. God's wrath is being revealed and is deserved. That's verse 18. So Paul immediately anticipates the objection that people don't know any better. People don't know any better. You know, how, how can God hold us accountable for not knowing who he is? We've never been told about God. But everyone does know because everyone suppresses the truth in their unrighteousness. That's where he goes. He goes, no, 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 no. Everybody knows about God. They suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. So why is God's wrath being revealed? That's verses 19 through 21. He says in verse 20, actually, he says, so they or we are without excuse. Here's your next fill in the blank. God's existence and glory is plainly revealed through creation. So one of the things we teach in DB Life, is, uh, which is coming up, if you've never gone through DB Life, I'd encourage you to sign up for that. And I love teaching the class, but we talk about, we answer the question, how do we know there is a God? We know there's a God, not by uh, human speculation, by man trying to guess that there's a God, but by divine revelation. And he's revealed himself to us. I talk about four different ways that he reveals himself to us. Um, but you could summarize it in two ways. There's general revelation and then there's special revelation. General revelation is what he's talking about here through creation. And then in chapter 2, he's going to talk about conscience, which fits into the category of general revelation. Special revelation would be uh, his word. He wrote a book and then Jesus showing up here on planet earth. So, and, and I call that actually, it's more than special revelation. I believe that's ultimate revelation. God showed up here. But he's talking here about general revelation. Look at verses 19 through 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. It's plain to them, to everybody on the planet. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. They, us, everybody. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. 
Isaiah 6, 3, the whole world is full of his glory. So he's talking about nonverbal communication all over the planet. So creation is a visible disclosure of the invisible God. Just as artists reveal themselves in what they draw, paint, and sculpt, so the divine artist has revealed himself in his creation. So when you look around creation, here's what comes to mind for me. He is a God of order, design, beauty, symmetry, detail, power, variety, and flourishing. So in our DB Life class, I talk about, I give evidence and arguments for uh, how God reveals himself to, to us through creation. There's the cosmological argument, cause and effect. There's the teleological argument. There's the moral argument, as I stated in Romans 2, conscience. And then, and then there's the heart argument. The heart argument, I don't know, did you see that heart argument? Damar Hamlin of Buffalo Bills, cardiac arrest on Monday night football, game was suspended, and there was more praying and God talk on ESPN than I've ever seen in the history of that channel. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, I was shocked to, to hear all that. Why would they stop a game like that? Because a human life is more important than some dumb old football game. That's the hard argument. Everybody knows the hard argument. We're, we're image bearers of God. What does that mean? God is a God of love. We have a love. We have a capacity to connect with people deeply. When we lose a loved one, we're not just going to look for another one to replace them. They're never... It, we're never able to replace them. Why? Because we connect in such a deep way. It leaves a hole in our heart. Why? Because we have this deep capacity to love. It breaks our heart. We're even disturbed when our pet dies. And they're just a pet. And yet we're troubled. Why? Because we are loving creatures created in the image of God who loves. That's the hard argument. Let me give you another argument, cosmological argument. All science proceeds on the assumption that inorganic life cannot produce organic life. You don't get a squirrel from a rock, okay, is really what it's saying. <laughs> Yet if there is no personal creator, then life must have happened by chance. Well, that's impossible. Yeah. One scientist, not a Christian, said that organic life happening by accident is as ridiculous and improbable as the proposition that a tornado blowing through a junkyard would assemble a Boeing 747. <laughs> That's Sir Fred Hoyle, the intelligent universe. So nobody can claim innocence because nobody can claim ignorance, is what he's saying here. Our problem is not mental, it's not intellectual, it's moral. I had some family members a number of years ago say, well, he'll never come to Christ because he's just too intellectual. No, <laughs> I don't buy that. It's not an intellectual issue. It's a moral issue. There's plenty of information for any thinking person to investigate it. I mean, he just committed intellectual suicide. That's his problem. And it's a moral issue. I mean, we know there is a God. We just don't like him telling us what to do. That's our problem. That's the bottom line. And so what happens is that when we suppress the truth and unrighteousness, he's going to describe here this downward spiral that begins to take place. And it's very consistent with what happened to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. This downward spiral. I, I resist, I push away the truth in unrighteousness. This is what it looks like. Here's the next one. We refuse to honor and thank God as the source and center of our lives. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God and give thanks to him. So, there is a creator in whom we are completely dependent on and accountable to. How do we show that? We honor him. That word honor means to glorify him. And we thank him. That means to be grateful. So, what exactly does that mean? I mean, we just go throughout the day and we, okay, God, I give glory to you and I thank you for this and that and whatever. No, it's not so robotic. We're talking about a relationship with the living God. This is what he's talking about here. That when we understand that we were created by him, in him we live, we move, we have our being, as Paul states in chapter 17 of Acts, as he's talking to a bunch of 
people that don't believe in God, the God of the, the Bible. He's just saying, don't you guys realize your very breath, your very living, your existence, your heart beats because of God. You're dependent upon God. You're accountable to God. That's the point that he was trying to make. C.S. Lewis says, we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is the appointed consummation. So the next time you're praising, glorifying something, think about what, what is it you're doing? You're enjoying it, whether it's delicious meal, it's a great sunset, it's seeing a little child. You go, oh, how sweet, whatever it might be, or your favorite team this weekend, playoffs. Your team's like, whoa, they're doing good. What are you doing? You're glorifying, you're praising, you're enjoying that's why C.S. Lewis also said in, in commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. So when he says, although they knew God, they did not honor him and give thanks to him, what he's saying is that they did not enjoy God. They did not put God at the center of their lives, the center of their enjoyment. Listen, we were created by God for God to give glory to God, my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes is, and God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. That's what He's inviting us to. But we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So we don't glorify Him, we don't praise Him. Sin is what we do when we're not satisfied with God. We begin to turn away from Him. We actually have this crazy thinking that we're going to actually find greater satisfaction in created things over and above the Creator. You see, holiness is being so happy in God that sin loses its appeal. Being happy in God? Yeah. Honoring Him and thanking Him. Glorifying Him and being grateful to Him. So when you look at Genesis chapter 3, what was the first thing that happened between Adam and Eve? Well, the serpent showed up and said, did God really say that you can't eat of this tree? He's a little bit snarky, sneering, getting them to question God's commandments. And then... She, she kind of gives a, a response, which it's not accurate to Scripture, like she had forgotten what God had commanded, and then the serpent responds by saying, you're not going to die. So what does he do? He's attacking the commandments of God and the character of God by getting them to doubt God's goodness. He's holding out on you. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. You're not going to be happy by obeying God. You're missing out. He's holding out on you. So that's where it starts. And so what do we do when we do that? We begin to not glorify God. We begin, we begin to not praise Him. We turn away from Him. We turn our back on Him. It creates this um, spiritual alienation because we're not giving Him His rightful place. He created us, and He's also redeemed us. Oh, my goodness, we should be rejoicing over that. We should be giving glory to Him, finding our deepest satisfaction in Him, but we don't. We doubt. We doubt we're going to be that happy by doing that, and we begin to turn our back on Him. This is what's happening here. This is part of that, that downward spiral. And then we become futile in our thinking. Here's your next couple fill in the blanks. We become futile in our thinking, and our foolish hearts become darkened. We think we're smarter than God. We think we're more loving than God. Look at verses 21 through 24. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Check this out, verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Did you know that we have our, a lot of our liberal universities are packed with professors that claim to be wise but are fools? I mean, that's our culture currently. And exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, and animals, and creeping things. Does that sound weird to you? Well, it shouldn't. This NFL playoff weekend with stadiums filled with worshipers giving religious devotion to Seahawks and Jaguars and Ravens and Dolphins and Bengals. I mean, we exchange the glory of God for birds and animals and creeping things. I mean, it's, we see it happening week in and week out. I mean, don't you guys think it's a little crazy? And I, I was seeing, I was watching the game yesterday, and, um, and some people really go all out for these games. They, like, wear costumes, and they dress up, and they paint their faces. None of you do that, do you? 
If you do, don't invite me to a Cardinal game, okay? That's crazy. Okay, maybe if you do, a, can you do that without worshiping? The, what you're, that's crazy. This is, that's all he's saying here. It's kind of interesting. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity and to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. We're going to save that verse for a little bit later. And so Genesis 3, it starts with unbelief. They're doubting God's goodness. And then I think this is pride, substituting ourselves for God. We, we think we're smarter than God, more loving than God. How, what does that look like in our culture today? What does that pride look like in our culture today? How about this? You've heard me say this many times before. Follow your heart. I just follow my gut. I just saw that. I, I was channel surfing the other day, and I saw that uh, The Rock, the big strong dude. What's that guy's name? Yeah, you got it. Um, but yeah, he was like, I just follow my gut. Well, that's insane, okay? I don't care how strong you are. That's idiotic. That's dumb. That's pride. You better be following God. You better look to Him. That, that makes no sense. Follow your heart. Be true to yourself. You do you. You decide right and wrong for yourself. Make your own plan. Make your own purpose. By the way, hey, hey, you know this. You didn't create yourself. You can't come up with your own purpose. And we just did a whole series on biblical worldview. You either have a biblical worldview or you have your own worldview. Your own worldview and biblical worldview, your worldview basically answers the question of, hey, where did we come from? What's our purpose? What went wrong? What's the solution? What's our future? And everybody's answering that in some way. If you're not answering that according to the Bible, guess what? Jesus said in Matthew 7, you're building a sandcastle. And it's just a matter of time. The wave's going to come and flatten it. So if you're saying, I just follow my gut. I follow my heart. Guess what? You're building a sandcastle. That's what he's saying here. That's insane. That's futile thinking. You got a foolish heart. That doesn't make any sense. And so you got unbelief, doubting God's goodness, pride. You begin to substitute you know, ourselves for God. You see this working its way out in Genesis 3. This is what he's talking about here. By the way, let me just say this. God's plan for your life is infinitely, eternally better than your plan for your life. So whatever you come up for, you know, for a plan for your life is nothing compared to what he offers you. I'm telling you, listen, listen. No one loves you like him. In his infinite wisdom and perfect love, he has established a plan for your life, both generally and also he has one individually, unique to you. Seek him with all of your heart. That's where you're going to flourish. I mean, he wants to protect you from the worst and provide the very best for you. He has your best interest at heart. He really does. But see, we begin to doubt that. Unbelief, doubting God's goodness, pride. I'm going to take life into my own hands. I can figure this out on my own. And then it moves right into idolatry, loving anything more than God. It's the next point on your notes. We exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things more than the Creator. Worship and serve, worship and serve created things more than the Creator. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? We fail to live for God's glory. We fail to see how desirable and satisfying He is. We fail to rejoice in Him and give our gratitude to Him. We don't live a life like that. We're drawn to created things over and above the Creator. Now, we will either worship and serve the Creator or something created. There's nothing, no other option on this planet, no other option. We are teleological beings. What that means, we, we have a sense of order, design, purpose, and so we have to live for something. Something has to capture your imagination, your heart's deepest loyalties and affections. you got to live for something. When you feel like life's not worth living, you put a bullet in your head. That's what people do when they commit suicide, when they overdose on drugs, or they just destroy themselves in, in reckless, crazy living. They have no sense of meaning and purpose. Everybody has to have a sense of meaning and purpose. We're teleological beings. Everyone, either consciously or subconsciously, looks to something and says, if I have that, fill in the blank. If I have that, my life has purpose. It has meaning. It has significance. My life will have been worth living if I have that. 
I'll know that I'm a somebody. Whatever that is, is what I worship and serve in an ultimate way. Now, there's an incredible range of idols. Anything can be an idol. Verse 24 says, therefore, God gave them up in the lust. That word lust, the Greek word is epithumia. It's not what you might think it is. We, we immediately think it's something super negative, but it's just desires of our hearts, but literally means over-desire and all controlling drive and longing. The main problem of our heart is not a desire for bad things. I mean, it could be bad things, but it's really an over-desire for good things. It is our turning created things into God's. So I was thinking about my own life this morning, about how I've done that. I did that with my marriage. I had an over-desire for my wife. I elevated her above my relationship with Christ, tried to get from her what I should have been getting from Christ. I crushed her under the weight of my unrealistic expectations. I nearly wrecked my marriage. I did that with my kids. And then when they didn't behave in the way that I thought they should, I, I took some major hits. I took it personal because I had too much of my identity attached to that rather than to Christ. I did that with my athleticism until I blew out my knee. I did that with my job. I've done that with almost every, a lot of different things in my life. Oh my goodness, I reaped the consequences of it. It wasn't good, it, but it gave me opportunity to, to redirect my sense of identity and security and significance and satisfaction back on Christ where it should have been from the beginning, and then I would have been able to respond to all of those much better. And so we tend to take good things and turn them into ultimate things. Look at verse 24. He talks about sexual lust in general as idolatry. And then in verses 26 through 27, he talks about homosexuality as idolatry. If you were to study in Colossians 3, he would say greed, greed as idolatry, money. And then in Galatians 4, he talks about religion as idolatry. So idolatry is looking to something to give you the kind of meaning, hope, and happiness that only God himself can give you. And we talk a lot about it around here because it's fundamental to our sin. It's what goes wrong. So it starts off with unbelief, doubting God's goodness, pride. I'm going to take life into my own hands and immediately the emptiness in my heart that should be filled up with God is filled up with a counterfeit God, a pseudo-savior. I begin to worship and serve created things over and above the Creator. And so every one of us has problems with idolatry. Idolatry is, is loving anything more than you love God. We all have problems with idols. Everybody here has problems with idols. I struggle with idols regularly. So if you don't know your idols, then you're becoming futile in your thinking and your foolish heart is becoming hard. I ought to be able to come to you and sit down with you and say, so what idols do you struggle with? What are the things that are competing for your heart's deepest loyalties and affections away from Christ? You see, I, I know that I'm battling an idol when good times lead to overconfidence and spiritual apathy and bad times lead to discouragement and despair. Why? Because Christ is better than any good times and he's bigger than any bad times. Contentment should, my, should be my M.O. If I understood what I had in Christ, oh my goodness, there's no good times that even come close to the goodness of God. There's no bad times that are beyond the bigness of God working in my life through those bad times. So contentment should be my M.O. It should be yours, too, if you really understood what you had in Christ, if, he was, if you truly loved Him. See, if you love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will be content in all circumstances because you will always have what you most want, and that's Him, regardless of the good times and the bad times. You guys tracking with me? So that's what God wants to do in our lives. So God has created a world where living under His rule and enjoying His blessing is the way that we can flourish in life. When we worship an idol in his place, he is no longer the one thing we have to live, you know, he's no longer the one thing that we should be living for. Something else is, it rules us, and ultimately we will do anything however destructive to ourselves or others to have it, increase it, or keep it. Now, it is the horizontal effects of exchanging God for an idol that Paul now turns, and this is how is God's wrath being revealed. So we just talked about why it's being revealed. 
It's because of our, unrighteous, our ungodliness and unrighteousness. I, I showed you the downward spiral, but, but how is it being revealed? Notice what it says here. God gave them up, verses 24, 26, 28. He's making a point here. So God does not force his way into our life against some theologian's opinions. There's a, there's a heavy uh, theologian uh, influence in our culture today. It's called Calvinism where God gives you, comes into your life and takes over your life beyond your resistance. That's not biblical. That is not biblical. God does not violate our free will. You cannot have relationship apart from freedom and choice. He doesn't give us irresistible grace, as they say, where He just overtakes us. He gives us opportunity. You can see it right here in the text. He turns us over in hopes to draw our hearts back to Him. And it becomes our choice. You cannot have relationship of love from freedom and choice. By the way, that, that theology is really popular today in America. Just be aware, be aware of it. Be on the guard. And it's not, it's not biblical when they come at it like that. And so he gave them up. God gave them up. The worst thing God could do is to give you what your sinful desires most want. Receiving the due penalty for their error. Verse 27. So the wages of sin is death. The consequences and wages of our sin is our own worst punishment. We self-destruct. So the complete disintegration of human Life is what we have here in verses 26 through 32. They're mainly found in verses 26 and 32, but some are found earlier in the passage. Verse 21, 24. So here's your next fill in the blank. Intellectual, emotional confusion and frustration. So we become futile in our thinking and our foolish hearts are darkened. I'm smarter than God. I'm more loving than God. He's holding out on me. He doesn't have my best interest at heart. So idols don't free us. Listen to me. Idols don't free us. They control us when we seek them. They disappoint us when we get them because it'll never be enough. We cannot fill that bottomless hole in our soul with anything other than God. So they control us when we seek them. They disappoint us when we get them, and believe me, they will devastate you when you lose them because you can't live without them, because you've placed all your, your heart's loyalties and affections upon that idol, and it's gone. Your life's over. That's why people commit suicide oftentimes, because they lost their sense of meaning, hope, and happiness in their idol. Their idol is gone. It's lost. So my inordinate anger anxiety, depression, isn't coming from my bad circumstances, but from my looking to created things, idols, to give me only what Jesus can give me. I mean, here's the insanity of it, is the tragedy of humanity is that we strive for and fail to find what we could simply receive from God and enjoy all the satisfaction, all the security, all the significance we would ever need. It's in Him. It's in Him, but we've got so many distractions here in America, so many things pulling at us, trying to convince us, you're not going to be happy obeying God. You're not going to be happy following Him. You're not going to be happy serving Him. And that insanity begins to take over. And then there's bondages and addictions. Now it's going to get really quiet. I need to reload here. Verse 24, 26, 28, God gave them up under the influence, controller of, of created things, idols. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves. This is sexual desires, lust in general is idolatry. And then in verses 26 to 27, homosexuality specifically is one of the many categories of sexual lust in general that is also idolatry. Now, this is the longest passage on homosexuality in the Bible. And notice it says that it's against nature, regardless of what people may say. Well, this is natural for me. Well, in your fallen 
person, it's natural for you, but that was never meant by God. It's contrary to nature. That would be in the category of a lust of your heart that has gone south. It's wrong. It's against nature. Now, let me give you a definition for marriage and sex within marriage. God designed sex for marriage between a biological man and a biological woman who are committed to a lifelong covenant relationship with one another. That's the definition. And that was established right from the get-go in Genesis 2, 7, 18 through 25, tells us this is the Creator's design and then in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, Jesus affirms that. I'm not going to deal with all the arguments. I've already gone through all the arguments, you know, with people. I've sat down and talked with people. A lot of people will say, well, that was Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, Jesus never said anything about it. Well, no, actually he did. He validated the standard of what was established in, in Genesis. And so anything outside that definition would be wrong. Let me give you a list. I think it's important in our culture today because a lot of people have a lot of confusion. There's confusion with sex, gender, sexuality, and so fornication, having sex outside of this covenant marriage is wrong. Adultery is having sex with someone that's not your spouse. Polygamy, rape, incest, homosexuality, bestiality, prostitution, a lot of prostitution going on. There's tons of it. Guys and gals selling their bodies online through video and pictures and all. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Pornography, that's rampant. Billions and billions of dollars in that. And then, let's add to that, entertaining any or all of those in your heart. Any of those that I just mentioned or all of those in your heart. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? If you look at a woman and you lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. I would say that probably everybody here is guilty of one of those, every one of us. And the, the thing we tend to worship the most, and I think this is why he's talking about sexuality, it's prominent here, is I think the thing we tend to worship the most is sex, is one of the things in our culture today. We live in a sex-saturated culture. Sexual promiscuity is, is terribly addictive and destructive. My wife went to a seminar yesterday with a number of people here at Desert Breeze at GCU, and it was on sex trafficking. And they said, Phoenix, Arizona, is a hub for sex traffickers. It's out of control. And she said that one of the cops, one of the police officers sat up there, and he got up and said, he said this, the pastor's in America today, are gutless because they're not talking about it. This pastor here is not gutless. Because that's why we talk about it. We talk about the hard things because that's what the Bible teaches. We've got to walk through this stuff. And I believe it. I believe that's the condition of our culture today because we're not talking about the tough issues. Write this down on your notes, 1 Corinthians 6.18. I'm going to just give you a quick explanation of the bondages and the addictions of sexual promiscuity and why. And there's so much more I could say, but let me just give you just a brief explanation here. It says, flee sexual immorality. It says, run from sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. So every other sin is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And when you think body, you think of STDs, things like that. No, it's, it's actually beyond that. that. That certainly is an issue and a major problem. But body means your whole person, your spirit, soul, body, spirit, soul. You're sinning against your person. Sex inside of marriage is to be a covenant renewal ceremony or celebration in the giving of your whole person, spirit, soul, body to one another. The man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And the man and woman were both naked and felt no shame. Body, soul, spirit, wholeness, wholeness. Sex is to mutually say to one another, I belong completely and permanently and exclusively to you. Body, soul, spirit. So healthy relationships work out like this. Boy meets girl, 
You love Jesus? Yep, I love Jesus too. Fantastic. Let's build a foundation on agape love. So they got agape love as a foundation. From that, they begin to build a soul kind of a relationship of friendship. That's called phileo. So you got agape love, you got phileo, they become best friends, they get to know each other, they decide they're going to get married about a year or so later, and they consummate their relationship on their wedding night, eros, body. When you start with the body before the spirit and soul, you undermine the spirit and soul. You disintegrate it. You take away from it. So sex outside of marriage creates a personal dissonance, a disharmony between your spirit, soul, and body. And over time, it loses its covenant-making power and will work backwards, making you less able to commit and trust another person. That is why you don't become physically naked and vulnerable to the other person without becoming vulnerable in every other way, spirit and soul. It's the only safe place to do that. Sex becomes a commodity when we abstract it from the whole person. That's what it's become. So God meant sex to be sacred. We've made it profane. And it's horribly destructive in our culture today. So we've taken it out of the context that God meant it for it to be. Sex outside of marriage is an exchange of products, not an exchange of whole persons. So let me just give you a quick example of this. Couples that cohabitate before marriage are not practicing for marriage, but for divorce. Because cohabitating increases your chances of divorce. Well, how many times I heard couples say, well, we're just, we're just kind of practicing here. No, you're not. You're going to probably end up in divorce. And those are secular, that's secular research, not Christian research. It tells us that. Because it's going against what God has created. You don't break God's rules. You break yourself against what He has established His rules. So lust is about getting. Love is about giving. So we're all guilty, but there is no sin that is a match for God's redeeming grace. I'm so thankful for that. I'm guilty. I'm sure probably everybody here is guilty, and yet, listen to me, that's why we're talking about the gospel. The gospel transforms our lives. I love the gospel. Because it's transformed my life. It continues to transform my life. We all need it in our lives. And so we can run to the Savior. And now the next one is decay of personal and social life. I gave you a whole list here. This is how it breaks it down, verse 29 through 31. Economic disorder, covetousness, social disorder, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, family breakdown, breakdown, uh, they disobey their parents, relational breakdown, gossip, slanders, insolent. Uh, arrogant, boastful, character breakdown, foolish, faithless, heartless. I mean, that describes our culture. Now, just in case you start saying, well, I'm not like any of that. Here's my last uh, point right here. You're going to love this. Religious people who shake their heads and roll their eyes self-righteously are just as guilty of idolatry. Look at verse 32. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And then he's going to transition right into chapter 2, where he's going to come after the religious, okay? That's where we're headed. So, look at your notes. In the beauty of the world, we can see God's glory. There's no doubt about it. In the brokenness of the world, we can see God's justice. That's the wrath of God's. As we see the beauty and the brokenness of this world, we are to run back to the place we see and experience God's mercy and grace, the cross. That's the point. That's what he's trying to get across. Now, the only way you can get your heart to stop worshiping other things like idols is to worship the right thing, and that's God. When the deepest passion of your heart is to honor, adore, glorify, and thank and praise Jesus Christ, then all other passions are put in their place. That's what we need to do each and every day. So, next weekend, religion can't save you. So, we, we said, we talked about it this weekend, you can't save yourself, religion can't save you either, Romans 2, 1 through 16. I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders and leaders. If you're new, we'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. If you've got any questions, I'd love to answer those questions for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. So, God, this is a hard-hitting message, and Lord, we're thankful for it because you love us so much. And when we find our deepest delight in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we know that 
those idols won't control us. They won't disappoint us. They won't devastate us because Christ is the source of our, our identity, our significance, our security, and our satisfaction. Thank you, God, for sending your son to bear your wrath on the cross for us, giving us forgiveness and a perfect righteousness before you. Reveal to us if or when we are on that downward spiral of unbelief, pride, and idolatry so that we can repent and turn back to you. May who Christ is and what he has done for us become more beautiful to our imagination and more attractive to our heart than anything else in this world. May you be most glorified in us as we are most satisfied in you, we pray in Jesus' beautiful name. And everyone said... Amen. Love you guys. God bless you.